Thanks, Kathy. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November meeting of the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority Commission. I am Andrew Taharzadeh, Assistant Director of Communications at the EDA. I am your moderator for this meeting, which means I will have control over the audio functions of this Zoom call and the control over the PowerPoint slides that will be used for the meeting. At this time, I would like to ask all those on this call to mute themselves. Now, I would like to welcome members of the commission to the meeting. Chairman Kathy Lang, Vice Chairman James Quigley, Secretary Ron Johnson, and members Lenny Hainsworth, Rocky Mitchell, Stephen Partridge, and our new commissioner, Rick Wagner. FCEDA President and CEO Victor Hoskins and Executive Vice President Alex Imes are on the call, as are EDA Consul Mike Graff, a number of EDA staff members, consultants who represent the EDA in offices overseas and California, and our marketing communications consultants. I would also like to welcome Fairfax County officials who have joined us for the meeting, as well as our guest speaker for the evening. Dr. Stephen Murray, President and CEO of the Virginia Economic Development Partnership. This is a public meeting of the commission and is being recorded. Presenting from the FCEDA tonight will be Chairman Lang, President Hoskins, Talent Initiatives Director, Michael Batt, and Communications Director, Alan Fogg. Members of the FCEDA Commission who have questions will have the opportunity to ask questions as they normally would during meetings. If anyone from the public has any questions, please select the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom screen to ask a question or email Cheryl Martelli of the FCEDA. Cheryl's email address is posted in the chat box. We will not answer questions from the public during the meeting, but we will respond to all questions in writing afterward. With that, I will ask Chairman Lang to begin the agenda. Chairman Lang. Thank you very much, Andrew. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November meeting. It certainly has been an exciting week. Uh, so I hope everybody has now gotten a little bit of rest. Uh, and. Uh, We'll be busy from here on out uh, with a new administration. So for tonight, we will be dividing this meeting into two parts. We'll have an open session, which we're in now, and we will finish that part of the, when we finish that part of, it, of the agenda, we'll take a very short break. When we resume the, the commission, EDA Council, Mike Graff, and invited EDA staff members will come back on a separate link for a closed session. When the closed session is over, just as a reminder, we will return to this link to reconvene the open session, certify that we met in closed session for only the specific reasons that we cited beforehand, and then adjourn for the evening. We have a great meeting tonight. In addition to the regular items, we will introduce our newest commissioner, Rick Wagner of Microsoft. We will say farewell to our departing commissioner, Christian Deschauer, and we are pleased to have Stephen Murray president of the Virginia Economic Development Partnership with us tonight. So let's get started. We'll start with our usual administrative item, which is to uh, have a motion to approve the minutes of the October meeting. Do we have a motion to approve? Oh, I'm going to, um, do we have a motion to approve? Madam Chair, I move to uh, accept the minutes of our last meeting. Great. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Was that Stephen Partridge? Or is that James? That was James. Okay. okay. I'm going to ask our attorney, Mike Graff, to do a roll call for votes since obviously it's difficult for us to communicate as, uh, as opposed to being in person. So Mike, would you go ahead and do that? Sure. Um, Mr. Mitchell, I believe he's absent this evening. That's correct. Kathy. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Johnson. Present. And, and uh, uh, you're voting in favor of the approval of the minutes? Yes, sir, I am. Okay, terrific. Uh, Mr. Wagner, welcome. Um, might be appropriate for you to abstain since you weren't at the meeting um, of which the minutes are um, the subject. Okay. Um, Ms. Hainsworth. Yes. 
Mr. Partridge. And I believe he'll be joining us later this evening, Kathy. Um, Vice Chairman Quigley. Aye. And Chair Ms. Lang. Yes. So the minutes are approved. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm very pleased to introduce the newest member of our board, Rick Wagner. He recently joined uh, Microsoft as president of Microsoft Federal, which is in Reston and supports federal agencies of all sizes and scopes as they deliver mission critical work. Many of us remember Rick because he spoke to us about talent attraction and retention at our board retreat earlier this year. If you may remember, he talked about some very innovative programs, especially in the area of internships that they were doing at Mantech. We're very fortunate to have someone with Rick's background and expertise join our board. And so I'd like Rick to say a few words about his background and his interests. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, so I, uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania and uh, educated as an engineer, haven't done a lot of engineering in my career, but that's, that was my background. I, I did spend about 13 years in California working for the Department of Defense uh, on Navy programs. Uh, since then, I've been a contractor. I, I actually moved to Northern Virginia in uh, 1997, so, so I've been here quite a while. Um, I'm a new resident of Fairfax County, just bought a house in, in uh, Vienna, so, uh, so happy to be here. And, you know, obviously national defense has been a big part of my career, but I, I have supported across the, uh, the full spectrum of the federal government, done some state and local as well. And uh, big interest for me in, in the, the development of careers for my employees and, and also education of our children. So kind of that, that full spectrum from, from beginning of childhood all the way through your career, you know, how can we, how can we develop people? Um, I, I think I spoke, uh, uh, you know, my daughter had some, some learning disabilities and they went undiagnosed and, you know, how that set her back. And so for me, that, that's, a, that's been a, a big thing that I've been involved. I'm involved with Kathy and Fairfax Futures. And, and so I'm very interested in that. Um, also, you know, support to, to uh, service members and first responders. Uh, I think that's a, that's a huge thing that we're all responsible for. So, um, so I'm, I'm glad to be part of the, the organization and, and I look forward to what we're gonna do in the future. Thank you so much, Rick. We're so happy to have you. So let me move on to the financial report. It was in your package. It's a consent item. I'll just review it. Uh, this report represents four months, 33% of fiscal year 2021 and 30% of the budget has been extended. The talent initiative program has spent expended $440, $4,241 of the $800,000 budgeted or 56%. And salary expenses, 27% uh, are currently running slightly below operating expenses, 32%. Are there any questions? Okay, great. One thing we will need to do at our next board meeting is we will need to um, uh, elect a treasurer uh, to our executive uh, committee because we're losing our treasure, Christian Deschauer. All right, uh, at the September meeting, we began a series of guest speakers to provide the commission and staff with various perspectives about the post COVID-19 economic recovery. These thought leaders will help us provide strategic vision for the future. As you may remember, we kicked off the series with Fairfax County Executive Brian Hill and last month we hosted Dr. Gregory Washington, the new president of George Mason University. And I was on a leadership council uh, conference with uh, Dr. Washington and, and Victor was a part of it. And it's clear that Dr. Washington and Victor have forged a very strong working relationship. I can't tell you how many times Dr. Washington mentioned Victor and, and their they're working together. So it's a really important relationship for us. And I'm so glad it's gotten off to such a great start. And he's an amazing man. He, he's a brilliant guy and he has a great vision for George Mason University. Uh, as noted earlier tonight, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Stephen Murray, president and CEO of Virginia Economic Development Partnership. Stephen has served as president and CEO of the VEDP since 2017. 
at VEDP has collaborated with state, regional, and local partners to craft a very ambitious vision focused on transformational goals, including accelerating employment growth, enabling every region in Virginia to grow, and moving Virginia back to the top of national business climate rankings. I think we're doing very well there. At VEDP, he led Virginia's successful state and local team bid for Amazon's HQ2, designed Virginia's 1.1 billion tech talent investment program, and launched a world-class custom workforce initiative, the Virginia Talent Accelerator Program. Previously, he served as Secretary of Economic Development in Louisiana, CEO of the LSU Foundation, and a consultant with McKinsey & Company. Dr. Murray earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from LSU, an MBA from Harvard Business School, and a doctorate in higher education management from the University of Pennsylvania, where his research focused on the linkages between higher education and the labor market. Dr. Murray will speak for about 20 minutes, and then commissioners can certainly ask questions of Dr. Murray. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray, for joining us tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you as well, and uh, what a pleasure uh, it is to join all of you tonight. Uh, let's see if I can, there we go, popped it up. Uh, let me first say before I forget, uh, congratulations to you all. I know it's been more than a year, but was so excited when Victor Hoskins was selected to be uh, the next CEO of the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. Uh, he's an absolute pro, as you well know. Uh, not only does he know the region and have all this wonderful experience, but he's one of the best collaborators I've ever worked with uh, in economic development. And he works with a team of absolute pros uh, at the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority, including Kathy Riley uh, and others who our team just absolutely loves uh, working with. So great to be with all of you. Uh, I probably am gonna share, I've probably uh, bit off a little bit more than I could chew with what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in, but I really look forward to your comments. So this is all about VDP and the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority winning the future and really winning the future uh, with talent. So let me first just uh, start off with, one of the things I track is what top site selection consultants think about. Uh, every, every year, area development uh, surveys the top site selection consultants. And one of the questions they've asked them now for I think 15 years or so is, what are the most important factors that you consider when selecting a new uh, location? And talent has always been important, but over the last decade, it's really jumped to the top to the number one uh, position. 10 years ago, site consultants rated uh, availability of skilled labor number three. Uh, recently, they rated it number one. Corporate real estate executives, 10 years ago, they rated it the sixth most important factor. Most recently, they ranked it number one as well. So that has become the dominant driver. Uh, it was the biggest thing that drove the Amazon HQ2 decision. Uh, it was a huge factor in the recent Microsoft decision for Fairfax County. And as you all well know, for many, many other projects that have selected Fairfax. So as you think about uh, the importance of talent and the importance of human capital development, my greatest ambition for Virginia, the, the thing that I think would, that would best position us to win the future and win the future together is that we would be America's top state for talent, not just the most educated state in America, but the state that is the best in the country in terms of developing talent from pre-K and early childhood all the way through uh, graduate school and lifelong learning. As we begin that journey, uh, we have a lot of strengths to build upon. You know, we have the best public schools in the South, uh, roughly fourth best in the country. We have one of the best higher education systems in the world, uh, regularly ranked number one or two. Uh, several of the top rated public universities in the country from UVA, William & Mary, Virginia Tech, and others. Uh, we're the fifth or sixth most highly educated state in the country in terms of educational attainment. And one of the reasons that our higher ed system is so strong is it is a decentralized system like that of the U.S. overall. And really look at why is the U.S. the envy of the world in higher education. Part of it is that we don't have a centralized higher ed system. We have a wide variety of models and institutions that have really been able to live out their great uh, ambitions and their unique missions. And we're also doing a lot of interesting and important things uh, at the community college level. Uh, most recently, one of those with Fast Forward uh, and Virginia Ready, thanks to the uh, great uh, leadership and philanthropy of, um, of uh, 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 Glenn um, uh, Young. So, um, but there are some areas that we need to get better. Um, the, the single most important thing we need to do to improve uh, our whole human capital development pipeline is really right at the beginning uh, with early childhood education, with childcare, 
Um, this is a place that we're not as strong as we are in the other areas. And indeed, the country as a whole is really behind uh, where we need to be. This is one area I've been focusing a lot of attention. I think this is so important that I accepted an invitation to co-chair uh, the Back to Work uh, Child Care Task Force with the Virginia Early Childhood Foundation. One of our, really our top goal coming out of that uh, is to make Virginia uh, within 10 years uh, to have uh, affordable quality uh, child care available to all uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, second, perhaps not as big of a factor for Fairfax, but insufficient pipeline of skilled trades in many regions. Now these next two issues are places where we were behind, but we're very quickly moving into a national leadership position. Um, until just a couple of years ago, we were actually not even rated in top 10 states for workforce development. With the creation of the Virginia Talent Accelerator Program and that partnership with the Virginia Community College System, as well as fast forward and some other things happening, we've quickly moved into a leadership position. I'm going to talk more about that later. Uh, you're also well aware of the Tech Talent Investment Program, $1.1 billion effort that came out of our Amazon HQ2 bid that's resulting in enormous expansions in Northern Virginia at George Mason, both at its flagship campus and in Arlington, as well as, of course, the Innovation Campus with Virginia Tech. Um, we do have a couple other issues that are holding us back. We do still have, even in Northern Virginia, a fairly significant underemployment issue, not as significant in Northern Virginia as the rest of the state and not as significant uh, in Virginia as in the rest of the country, but we do still have an underemployment uh, challenge. I uh, don't have time to go into that today in great depth. And finally, some significant gaps between urban and rural areas um, like, like other states have as well. So we do have some places um, to get better. Um, I wanted to mention briefly, uh, VDP specifically has three particular ways that we're contributing in a significant way to workforce development and to human capital development generally in Virginia. Uh, one, uh, the Virginia Jobs Investment Program, or VJIP. This is an incentive program that uh, reimburses companies for reskilling uh, employees, either for expansions uh, or for, for new projects. Uh, this is something that's been used quite a few times uh, in Fairfax County over the years. More recently, uh, just a couple of years ago, we created the Virginia Talent Accelerator Program, which is on track to be the best custom workforce program in the country. Instead of providing grant dollars, this program provides fully customized workforce solutions, recruitment uh, and screening of talent, as well as development and delivery of fully customized uh, workforce solutions. Really excited about the progress that they're making. Uh, we have a new experience center that is just about done in Richmond. We'd love to give you all a tour at some point so that you get a better feel of what this program offers. Uh, and then finally, what's less frequently utilized, uh, we do have uh, uh, systemic talent initiatives that we develop. Probably the you know the best example of that uh, would be the um, would be the uh, the tech talent investment program that we helped to create in collaboration with Chev and other higher education partners across the Commonwealth. Um, let me talk about workforce development for a minute. I mentioned that while uh, Virginia generally is considered one of the best states in the country for education at all levels, uh, workforce development, we were not uh, considered as strong. This was a, the ranking from actually 2019. Um, we were not in the top five. In fact, we were often not in the top 10 uh, of workforce development rankings. Uh, it tends to be dominated by those states that offer fully customized workforce solutions. Uh, top of the list, certainly Georgia, South Carolina and Louisiana. Um, our goal is to get to the top of this list and to get there as quickly uh, as we possibly can. When we first uh, went to the General Assembly in early 2018, this is the direct quote of what we said that we were out to achieve. We were gonna transform from being unranked for workforce development to having a top five program within three years and one of the top three, maybe number one within five years. So that ultimate goal is to really be the best state in the country, really across the board uh, in education and workforce development. So let me give you a sense of the progress that we're making. Um, we launched the program in 2018. We actually improved into the top 10. Uh, we've been outside the top 10 in one of these rankings, moved to number seven, also number seven in the other one. In 2019, uh, uh, last year, we moved up to uh, number five uh, in the business facilities ranking, stayed at number seven. Uh, area development. And then this year, earlier this year, we moved up to number three uh, in business facilities, number four um, in, uh, in area development. So we are on our way. Uh, we're already in the top five, as you can see, and we're on our way to the top three. And again, with the goal to get to roughly number one or two 
uh, by 2023. With all the incredible assets that we have to draw from in Virginia, uh, we think we're going to get there. Uh, this has been uh, really a great uh, collaboration between VDP, Virginia Community College System, uh, and other higher education entities. I don't think we've done, we certainly have not done a project yet, I don't think in Fairfax, uh, but I don't think it'll be too long uh, before we do. We just kind of shifted from the pilot stage about a year ago to now starting to do more projects all across Virginia. So we look forward to taking on our first big project in Northern Virginia. I mentioned the Tech Town Investment Program. Uh, this perhaps hasn't had as much media coverage recently, but it is full steam ahead. This was adopted uh, unanimously or near unanimously by the Virginia General Assembly. Great uh, bipartisan support. We're talking about literally doubling the number of graduates each year at the bachelor's and master's level in computer science, computer engineering, and software engineering. The two biggest pieces of that are George Mason uh, University, which again is expanding in its flagship in Arlington, as well as Virginia Tech, which likewise is expanding in Blacksburg, as well as uh, its new innovation campus. This is a commitment of roughly $1.1 billion uh, over 20 years, very front loaded though for facilities, for startup packages, for new faculty lines. We're talking about hiring more than 300 new faculty across the Commonwealth of Virginia and ultimately doubling the number of graduates we produce each year. Uh, while most of my work at VDP has been in the higher ed part of this, there's also some very important work happening uh, at the K through 12 level as we continue to build out you know, all our efforts around uh, Virginia being one of the leaders in computer science in K through 12. There's also some great things happening uh, in tech internships at the higher ed level uh, as well. So this is underway. This is going to be, I think, one of the most powerful te tech talent uh, pipelines for uh, Northern Virginia. Roughly half of all of this investment is happening in Northern Virginia with uh, George Mason, with uh, Virginia Tech, and with the Northern Virginia Community College. Um, so as we look more broadly at our goals for the Commonwealth, we have five uh, simple but very ambitious goals. We want to get Virginia back to being one of the top 10 states for growth in terms of both employment growth and growth in median earned income. Uh, just a few years ago, we were in roughly number 40 in the country. We've moved up to roughly number 15 to 20, kind of moves around a little bit, so we're heading in the right direction. We also want to position every region to participate in the growth of the Commonwealth. Our third goal is to get back to being the best state for business in the country. We got there pretty quickly on CNBC, number one, but as you'll see in a minute, we still have some room for improvement in other uh, rankings. We want to be the top performing state economic development uh, organization in the country. And finally, to be a super collaborator. Really, as Victor knows, this is really all I'm trying to get done. I don't really have many goals other than these five things, uh, but they do consume quite a bit of effort and energy uh, you know, to get there. Um, what are the pieces that are really going to be required to bring this all together? So we've got <clears throat> a number of areas that are really long-standing strengths in Virginia, things like education, like workforce, quality of life, this great location that obviously Fairfax has really leveraged uh, as well. But we also have some recent uh, advances. Three years ago, um, the marketing budget for Fairfax County was about 10 times the marketing budget for the Commonwealth of Virginia as a whole. Uh, now they're more similar, <laughs> so we're heading in the right direction. Uh, I mentioned the Tech Town Investment Program, the Custom Workforce Program. Rural broadband investment, not as big of an issue for Fairfax, but a very important issue in terms of helping Virginia as a whole come into uh, the mainstream, not just for economic development, but for education, for healthcare, and for other areas. Um, a number of other things with port investments, transportation investments. Now, there's also some additional things that we need to do. I talked about childcare and early childhood education, um, prepared development sites, super important, maybe not as big of a factor for Fairfax, but very important for other parts of Virginia as we build out our advanced manufacturing and uh, logistics segments. Um, there are some targeted tax, change, tax changes that would be helpful. While Virginia is a relatively low tax state for existing traded sector enterprises, we're actually a relatively high tax state for startups and for uh, expansions of existing companies. And mostly that's because of the lack of uh, statutory buy right uh, incentives and credits to encourage capital investment and job creation. Um, we have one of the best trade development programs in the country, but we're not yet where we need to be in international trade. We've put together, uh, working with Secretary Ball and many other uh, leaders and organizations, uh, a comprehensive, really the most comprehensive international trade plan uh, in the country, which we're starting to implement. Uh, we need to continue to push forward in our marketing efforts to really be as good 
for Virginia as you all have been for Fairfax. And we've got, got a ways to go uh, to get there. Uh, the governor's got an exciting uh, community college uh, education initiative called G3 that we think is terrific. And then of course, we need to complete the expansion of the custom workforce program I talked about. So there's more to it, uh, certainly than the things on this page, but these are the big, big pieces um, as we think about tech talent more broadly, there are a range of other things from helping people navigate education in the labor market um, and expanding opportunities with apprenticeships and internships, um, recruiting talent and marketing. Virginia is a great place for talent, which I know you all are doing some great work in, but these are kind of the big pieces as we, as we think forward. I did mention our position in the rankings. So we bottomed out a few years ago. We've been on our way back up. Uh, while we are number one in CNBC, uh, it's the only business climate ranking that we're number one in. So in general, those rankings that are uh, you know, tied to our um, uh, sort of the, the, the fundamentals of Virginia, like education, poverty, wealth, income, those sorts of things, the quality of our, our infrastructure, we do quite well. Uh, we don't do as well uh, in the perceptions of Virginia as a place to do business. We do well, um, but we tend to rank in the 10 to 15 range uh, nationally. Uh, always behind Georgia, North Carolina, um, um, uh, all, often Florida, always behind Texas. So when you look at uh, corporate America, I think the gap is not a, a gap in reality. I think it's a gap in perception um, that those other states have simply done a much better job for a much longer period of time marketing themselves. So there are places we can get substantively better, but we're also working on just closing that perception reality gap. And again, this is a place that Fairfax has really been a leader in Virginia for many years and certainly continuing, I know, under Victor's leadership. Um, let's shift a little bit and talk about recovery. Uh, obviously, this was a huge, um, had a huge negative impact on the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, we were very fortunate that overall, the economic impacts in Virginia have been considerably less than the country as a whole. Two big reasons for that, uh, both of which are evident in Northern Virginia. The biggest one probably is that we've got a large portion of our economy that's driven directly and indirectly by the federal government, as you all know, roughly a third of our economy. But additionally, uh, perhaps less well known is we have an unusually large percentage of our employment in Virginia that's associated with professional occupations that can be performed uh, remotely. So those two things together really help us. Obviously, the places that were really hit sector wise were hospitality and retail. Uh, and we think they're gonna take quite some time uh, uh, to recover. I'll talk a little bit more about recovery in a moment. What I wanna show you on this slide, if you look at, um, this is uh, the change in, in employment uh, levels since uh, before the pandemic uh, through August. I didn't have a chance to catch the September data. So statewide, we're down 6.3%. Uh, um, that's a little worse than if you just looked at the unemployment rate uh, difference, because that's gotten a lot better. And the reason is that you still get a lot of folks that, um, uh, are not working who were working before, but they've either gotten discouraged or they may not have the childcare that they need uh, to go back to work. So when we look at this, this full picture, uh, I think we have to make sure we're not just looking at the unemployment rate. We should also look at the total change in employment, which is reflected here. Um, also think about people that were working full-time that are now part-time, but would prefer to be full-time. Uh, you've also got folks that used to have a second job and lost a second job. So altogether, we still have several hundred thousand people uh, in Virginia that are economically in a worse position than they were before uh, the pandemic. Uh, of course, you're probably also aware it's been very much a K-shaped uh, recovery. Uh, the folks have a bachelor's degree or higher, in many cases are basically in the same position they were before the pandemic. Uh, those with less education, those that are were in lower wage positions, those that are people of cover, color on average in a worse uh, position. So, but this kind of gives you a sense of the variation across Virginia. By the way, the reason for this variation is mostly because of differences in the industry mix. Obviously, there were some industry sectors that were more heavily impacted by social distancing uh, requirements uh, than others, and the mix of those is kind of varies across industry sectors across uh, the Commonwealth. Um, the other thing we're seeing really throughout this uh, pandemic and as we get into the recovery is a significant reduction uh, in the number of uh, job postings. There are still a lot of postings, especially in Northern Virginia, uh, I might add, but it's still quite uh, significantly below where it was before. Um, I don't have a slide on this, but one of the things that I'd encourage you all to keep in mind, and if Victor's already thinking about it, is that um, it's not just a matter of us getting back to full employment, that when we do get back to full employment, it's highly likely that the mix of employment across industries and occupations is gonna be somewhat different than it was pre-pandemic. We're gonna see more 
um, tech jobs, more business services. It'll be very good for Northern Virginia. Uh, likely fewer jobs in retail, fewer jobs in hospitality. There's some other differences, but those are kind of the big ones um, that I think about. As we've thought about recovery, and we've been doing a lot of thinking about it, we think it's the single most important thing Virginia should be focused on right now after public health. Uh, and I think increasingly we'll see that shift happen as we start to get toward uh, widespread access to vaccines in 21. Um, there are four big areas that we see as growth opportunities um, going forward. And at least three of these would be big opportunities for Fairfax, Northern Virginia. First, and again, perhaps not as big of a focus for you all, but we do think there's going to be a permanent shift with re manufacturing, reshoring, and supply chain as companies uh, try to de-risk um, their uh, supply chain networks and try to get a little bit closer to customers. It may not be quite as big as what some thought initially, but we do think this will be material. Uh, second, accelerating what we sort of loosely call digital Virginia, but just think about the tech sector broadly, cloud computing, software development, data centers, cybersecurity, the places that uh, Fairfax is just an explosive uh, leader. Uh, we think those things are gonna continue to grow, in fact, accelerate quite dramatically compared to where we were uh, pre-pandemic. And by the way, think about the Tech Town Investment Program. It made sense before the pandemic. Now with everybody accelerating their digital transformations, it makes even more sense. So we got a big jump on most of our competitor states with that. Um, third is telework. And this is probably, I would guess, more of a risk perhaps for Fairfax than an opportunity. Um, <clears throat> This is still very much in flux. We've been doing a lot of research on this. Uh, we've got a significant survey we're getting ready to do nationally and also of graduates of Virginia colleges and universities to get a, a better handle on this. Let me first say that I, I think the one thing that'll be helpful to Fairfax is that while we do think there will be a big increase in, in remote work, um, we currently think the bulk of it, the strong majority of the, the, the increase will be um, hybrid. Uh, in the sense that people may work from home more often than they did before, but they'll still be uh, sort of tethered, if you will, to a hub or to an office that they have to go in uh, fairly frequently such that they're not going to look, you know, at leaving that region. We do think there'll be um, an increase in permanent remote work. It's still hard to say exactly how that's going to be. I definitely do not see that holding back uh, uh, Northern Virginia or Fairfax, um, but I do think it'll be a factor and something important uh, for you all to keep your eye on. Uh, and then finally, and this was sort of uh, foreshadowed by my earlier points um, about uh, the shift in the employment mix across industry sectors, there'll be a lot of people, most of the people that, that are unemployed today that were employed before uh, the pandemic began, will ultimately be able to go back to either their previous job or at least to their previous occupation. But we do think there'll be a significant large minority, tens of thousands of people in Virginia who will not only be, not be able to go back to their previous job, they won't be able to go back to their previous occupation either. And so reskilling is gonna be a really, really important uh, factor. I think the community colleges are gonna be really, really important there. Um, that's something we're putting a lot of energy on right now. And we're gonna be advocating during the upcoming regular session for funding some of those key programs like Fast Forward um, and the Virginia Ready uh, initiative that goes along with that. So some of the things we're thinking of specifically on recovery, I, talked about reskilling, certainly our two programs, the Virginia Talent Accelerator Program and, and the VJIT program, those will be very, very important. I also talked about uh, Fast Forward and G3. Uh, international trade development, we think will be a big opportunity for companies to get additional international sales. So that'll be a key put push. Um, site development for rural localities, um, typically the most common reason we lose a manufacturing or distribution project is the lack of a well-prepared site compared to competing states. Uh, rural broadband, and of course, finally, marketing. Super, super important. I think you all, I think one of the smartest things that Fairfax has done for many, many years is investing significant dollars in marketing. Uh, you could stand to do even more, and certainly at the state level, we should be doing an awful lot more uh, than we are, but at least we've gotten in the game, and I think what we are doing is a very um, high quality. Um, I also just wanted to mention here before I uh, go to conclude, that uh, one real positive of this shift, obviously many negatives of the pandemic, but one is that when you really look at the industry sectors whose fortunes are being lifted, or, or let's say whose growth is being accelerated by the pandemic, there are largely areas in which Virginia is a national leader, right? Cloud computing, data centers, autonomous systems, e-commerce, food and beverage processing, uh, logistics. These are areas that Fairfax, many of them in Fairfax and Northern Virginia and Virginia as a whole 
um, has some significant uh, leadership plays with a variety of companies and startups that are involved in these sectors. And we think that's going to really bode well for our recovery. So I just wanted to end on kind of a, a hopeful note here. As I think about the future of Virginia and the future of Northern Virginia, these are some of the images that I have in mind. Now, some of these I think are definitely going to happen. Others I think are likely uh, if we take uh, the right action. So we're going to have a growing commercial uh, space sector on the Eastern shore. Lots of exciting things happening there. A lot of connections in Northern Virginia as well. We're going to get to nearly ubiquitous broadband access in Virginia within seven to eight years. We have the potential to buck America's uh, rural decline trend. Uh, we're going to see gigawatts of solar power, gigawatts more of solar power in, in Virginia, gigawatts of offshore wind energy in Virginia. I think we're going to see more than $10 billion a year in data center investment. We're going to lead the country in container port capabilities. We're going to lead America in export-oriented manufacturing wins. Micron is a great example of that. Roughly a billion and a half dollars per year in new exports will come from that when it's fully up and running. We're going to lead America in unmanned systems in rural and small metro tech centers. Think about what 1901 Group and others are doing there. We're gonna lead American computer science, the largest investment to our knowledge in US history in computer science education. We're also gonna lead America in data science, one of the most explosive, fast growing, exciting fields uh, that I think uh, Northern Virginia is gonna be a big player in as well. And ultimately and most importantly, we will lead America in human capital development. So I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic uh, about the future of Fairfax, the future of Northern Virginia, the future of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I can't thank you enough for um, the wonderful collaboration that we've had uh, with Victor and Kathy and the whole team uh, at Fairfax. And also really I'm encouraged with the work that you all have done to improve collaboration across uh, Northern Virginia. Uh, when we first sat down in, um, I guess it was September of 2017, our very first meeting to talk about going after Amazon HQ2. Uh, Victor Hoskins walked in the room. In fact, Victor actually was one of the first people. Uh, I remember calling Victor and I said, Victor, I really think that I know we normally do everything just at the locality level, but I think if we could collaborate on this, Amazon's really pushing for a regional you know, response. I think we could create something really special. Victor was one of the first people that came on board and advocated for that. And ultimately the regional collaboration that he helped to create and work with us from beginning to end helped us win the biggest project uh, in history. And I think even though it didn't go to Fairfax, I think Fairfax obviously I think is a big beneficiary of that project as well. Anyway, I will stop. I'd love to um, take any questions you all may have for me. <clears throat> That's a very exciting set of number ones that we're going to achieve over the next just next few years or so. So thank you for that. That's really exciting, Stephen. Thank you so much. So let me open it up to the uh, commissioners for any questions you might have. James? I saw him come off mute. Yeah, Stephen, hi. Uh, yes. James, quickly. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. It is really exciting too. It's not only great to share this with the the commissioners here, but with the staff of the EDA, who's focused on many of these same initiatives every single day. Um, and I think the intentionality of all this is, is, is exciting for all of us to see what, where the state's going and how much it aligns with what we're thinking about. The state's done always a, a fairly good job, certainly Northern Virginia on, on education. And what we found pre-COVID, I, I may be serving you up a softball, but pre-COVID, we, you know, we had a talent uh, withdrawal, a sucking of talent from the region. So we spend money in it and time and, and convince people uh, to, to come to school here or, or obviously through our public school systems educate a lot of people, but we were losing a lot of millennials uh, who were leaving the region. How, do you, how does the state see placemaking and from a workforce perspective, not just educating and putting the money in, but are some of these programs thinking about how do we keep the students here? Yeah, um, I'm so glad you raised that topic, James. It is super important. Um, you know, I, I wish I had the answer to that. I don't have the complete answer, but on your specific question of placemaking, I think it is profoundly important. Um, many years ago, um, when I was living in Baton Rouge, I had the chance to, um, uh, I, I was gonna say get to know, but really meet and hear a number of presentations from a gentleman named Andres Duwani. Uh, some of you may know that name. He was sort of the, the 
sort of grandfather of new urbanism in the United States and really making the case for great mixed use, walkable, vibrant, you know, communities, mm. pedestrian friendly communities. And he laid out a vision that I just thought was incredibly compelling. And it's a vision that I perceive Fairfax to be trying to move toward, you know, in recent years, as you've worked to attract more residential and more mixed use development. Um, it's a vision, by the way, that I don't think is talked about enough in what helped to attract Amazon to Arlington. Um, the work that both Arlington County had done under Victor's leadership for years, but also um, the work that uh, JBG Smith had done and their vision for you know, mixed use development and controlling enough property to, be, property to be able to build that vision. So I actually, when I look at the, the talent migration challenge in Northern Virginia, I think placemaking is for sure one of the top three issues. Um, one, of the, one of the very most important ones, obviously affordable housing, uh, well, really housing stock in general, uh, but housing stock, I think, in the context of placemaking, um, I think personally is super important and something we've really got to think about. Um, I used to live, um, my wife and I, when we got uh, engaged right out of graduate school in Boston, uh, the first place we lived was Arlington, uh, Clarendon specifically, mm. right after um, the development of the Clarendon Park development. That's where we actually live, was on the, on the, on the, on the, um, the park there in a townhouse. And I mean, it was just, it was like Disney World. I mean, the, being able to, um, to, you know, have literally within two blocks, you know, restaurants and dry cleaner and banks and dentists and everything. It was absolutely wonderful. And um, anyway, I'm sorry I'm rambling, James, but I just want to endorse your idea. And, um, you know, I'm not an expert on uh, mixed use development, but I, I just believe that Placemaking in general is a, an area where Northern Virginia, on average, is not quite where it needs to be. There's certainly many places that are have really nailed that, but um, overall, I think it's it's something that we really stand to make a lot of progress on. And I just can't endorse enough you all thinking of that as part of your portfolio uh, of what you work on in Fairfax, particularly as you think about like quality of life, right? And not it's not just about tons of high paying jobs, right? It's also having a place that people really love to live and that you know works for people of different walks of life and all that. Thank you, Steve. That's great. Do we have another question? Sure, it's Linny. <clears throat> um, when you think about all the different threads of activities and goals, although you only identified a few major <clears throat> goals, but underneath that tent were several streams um, of key accomplishments we're looking forward to. What guardrails, what bumpers should we be looking for to make sure we're on the right track as we move down the road to achieve those goals? You know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering your question directly, Lenny, so if, if I'm not, please redirect me. But one of the things I would say is that I think the biggest risk that we face in Virginia and economic development is complacency. You know, things, are so good in Virginia in so many ways. We could say the same thing about Fairfax, you know, with exclamation points, perhaps, perhaps, right? But I also think when you think about the assets we have, the wealth that we have, the human capital that we have, in my view, we should be setting the goal to be just the, the best of America, basically, right? And not just in business, but the whole picture, you know, education and quality of life and, you know, all those different dimensions. And I think sometimes we, there's so much success in Virginia and so many things to feel good about that we just get a little bit complacent. So I'm not sure I answered your question exactly, but if you were to ask me the question, what's the one thing that I, that I wish I could snap my fingers and do, it would be to create a sense of urgency among all of us involved in this topic in Virginia that as good as we are, we could be so much better and we ought to really get after it because we've got all the assets we need to get there. But did I answer? I'm not even sure I answered your question. I'm so sorry. You made me think about it. No, that. no, don't apologize. You did because it also answers the question about competition yes. with other municipalities, right? Yeah, I, I think a lot of other places are hungrier than Virginia. They just are. Um, mm -hmm. uh, now, in some ways they have to be because they're not, they don't have a lot of the assets that we have. But I just think we have to be really careful about you know, losing our position. And by the way, if you were to say, when I look around the world, the one place that, uh, one of the places that's really inspired me um, in terms of really charting a course for its future is uh, Singapore. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's issues, the political structure, but if you look at it economically, 
like 40 years ago, it was one of the poorest places in the world. And today it's one of the wealthiest uh, places in the world. Um, and they did it on purpose. And at the center of that transformation was their version of the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. It's called the Singapore Economic Development Board. And one of the things that they did in Singapore that you all are doing now in Fairfax was to recognize that success in economic development is not just about marketing and transactions and incentives, although those things are important, but it's also about the talent pipeline. It's about placemaking. Like they really looked at it in a holistic, it's about infrastructure. They looked at it in a holistic way and really answered the question, what are the things we need to do in each of these domains to really achieve these ambitions that we have uh, for this place? And it's, it's amazing what they've achieved. I think it's amazing what Fairfax has already achieved in the last few decades. But I would suggest to you that I think Fairfax can go even further. And maybe as you look ahead the next 10 years, 20 years, that that transformation could be as significant in that period of time as it was in the last 20 years. Thank you. Steve, I have a question about early childhood mm -hmm. education because it's something that I'm very interested in and very committed to making sure we do something proactively to address. And do you, do you think we're ready to make systemic changes? Are we, are we gonna put money into it and make sure that it's, it addresses some of the socioeconomic and racial in, inequities that are, that we, that are really going to hold us back. And, it, you know, from a human capital standpoint, from a, from a getting every child, every child is our, you know, they're all our children. We need to make sure every one of them has a chance for success. So I'm excited about hearing about this task force, but are we ready? <laughs> are we going to do something? Yeah, are we going to fund um, it? <laughs> I, I don't know that we're, I don't know that we're ready to do something transformational right now. Um, but we're starting to talk about that. I mean, the thing Good. that was kind of exciting that came out of the task force, I forget the name, I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the presenter, but there was one of the presenters that did such a wonderful job. Uh, she actually is in, uh, works for, I think, the Department of Education, works in the Education Secretariat. Her name will come to me. But one of the things that she talked about was the combination of um, establishing a, an ambitious shared vision for the future um, and then sort of taking measured steps to go you know, from point A to point B, right? If we talk just about childcare, for example, the amount of money required to do what we really need to do is quite a substantial amount of money. Now, a state of our size and wealth can do it, um, but it would probably be unrealistic to think we would do it in one session, right? Mm -hmm. But if we could set that goal that by 2030, have each governor, by the way, embrace this, hopefully Governor Northern will be the first, um, that by 2030, we will be able to make uh, affordable childcare available to every Virginia family, um, and then take measured steps to go from point A to point B. And of course, there's different roles that different stakeholders have to play, but the first step I think is agreeing on that it needs to be a priority. And early childhood education, you know, it's just amazing. I mean, the, the reason, if you kind of, if we did education over to begin with, right, we would actually spend much more of the money- The front end. Front. Yeah. I mean, where brain development is just on fire. Um, yeah. I mean, I just have become a huge, I've, I've seen this, by the way, with our own, you know, children, we have four young children and my, my wife uh, got her doctorate in developmental uh, psychology, basically child development, and um, just saw like how much she, she just invested in them and how they, you know, just develop, you know, as you just think about like wanting more people to be able to have a great start yeah. in life. And if we're really going to make this human experiment, this um, American experiment, you know, capitalism, the whole thing work for everybody um, and really give everybody a chance, we've got to get that early, those early years right. So we're not there yet, but I think if groups like us and others can keep talking about this and pushing forward, I think we can get there. It's a long-term thing for businesses to understand. For example, you've got to start then. While they want their tech workers now, they won't have their tech workers in the future if they haven't started, you know, 20 years earlier. So, thank so thank you. Keep pushing. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Kathy, I might just ask Stephen. Great presentation. Sorry I came in a little late. We have our board meeting a couple <laughs> times a year that aligns with this one. Um, from a workforce standpoint. You mentioned some of the industries realigning and maybe less hospitality, some of the retails changing, maybe more tech. 
are you seeing a need at the state level to put more resources into trying to convince that early pipeline, whether the K-12 or, or sort of Nova pipeline to go into these careers? Because as much as we're promoting them, as much as we're getting some of the tech talent funding, it's still a hard sell to convince kids to go into some of these high tech jobs because of the math requirements, because yes. some of the other hurdles. So are you seeing some need to refocus on maybe the K-12 to get more of them into that field if no, those I, other jobs I, go I away? Really, Steve, I really am. In fact, we, we owe a great debt of gratitude to Peter Blake, um, the director of the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia, because the first draft of the Tech Down Investment Program was only higher ed. <laughs> and he said, well, what, what about the pipeline? You know, what about K-12? And he's so right. And honestly, if we, if we had it to do over from the beginning, I think we would have put, we just, it, it kind of got in a little late. And so I think the K-12 piece was probably not as big as it should have been, partly just because we didn't have the ideas. It was sort of like, well, we know how to like calculate the cost of additional faculty and degrees and all that, but we didn't really have a model for how we would work on the pipeline. You know, one of the most important things that I've learned as I've studied higher education in the labor market is that, and by the way, if, if you haven't heard this before, it's a very important thing to know. It turns out, you know, we think about, you know, telling kids like, well, here's like these fields that pay really well. And so maybe they would choose to go that way. But it turns out that compensation for most students is actually not a major factor, uh, at least not for picking a particular degree field. They might choose to go to college uh, in order to have better prospects generally, but it's actually not the not even one of the major factors. It's more, what are they good at? And what do they like? And that really gets at Steve's point about helping people be in a position in the K-12 environment where they are both academically prepared to be successful in one of those rigorous programs, but also where ideally they've been introduced to it, right? And you know, I, I knew growing up in rural Mississippi, one of the things I didn't appreciate until much later was just how much my views of what was possible for my career were just shaped by what was around me, right? And that's true probably yeah. even the age of the internet that th something can be there, but if you don't know anybody that's done it, you know, if you don't feel connected to it. So this, this process of career exploration and discovery, I mean, I just think in general, one of the best investments we can be making that we're not making now practically at all is in sort of career planning and um, exploration activities. You know, we don't have nearly enough going into that. I know it's money out of the classroom and there's challenges with all that, but we've got to help folks really uh, find things that sort of turn them on fire and and help them understand the, you know the past to get there. So anyway, long story short, Steve, you're absolutely right. And I actually do think at this point in Virginia, the much bigger opportunity to build a talent pipeline is actually pre you know higher ed. It's in the K twelve level more than it is anything we're doing in higher ed. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for your leadership, and of course. Um, we love collaborating with you. We will continue to collaborate with you. Um, we've got a very exciting future ahead of us, um, the state the, and of course this region and all the regions across the, the Commonwealth. So thank you, Stephen, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kathy. Thank all of you for just the great work you do and how important you all are and how important Fairfax is to Virginia's economy. We're very grateful for the collaboration. Thank and Stephen, on behalf of our team, I want to thank you so much for all your partnership and all the deals that we've done, all the work we've done together, and for your leadership in, in bringing the collaboration together, because you know that, that you were right in the middle of that. This North Virginia Regional <laughs> Collaboration would not have happened without you. And it was so easy to do, I'm sure. <laughs> it was easy once Victor was <laughs> leading Fairfax, I think. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Great to Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so next on our agenda, we are going to be saying farewell to one of our commissioners. We announced last month that Christian Deschauer, who has served with distinction as our treasurer and assistant secretary for much of the time that he served, is going to be leaving us. <clears throat> well, I don't mean leaving, leaving us. I mean leaving the board. <clears throat> he certainly will be around in uh, in uh, in Virginia. The Board of Supervisors named Christian to our board in June of 2016. He is the Director of Public Affairs and Innovation at Transurban, an Australian company that manages and develops urban toll road networks in Australia and North America. Transurban's North American headquarters is in Tyson's, and Christian is responsible for the company's government affairs program for Northern America, for North America. 
Uh, Christian came to us with a great background to the board. He previously uh, was, um, he led the government relations for Fairfax County Chamber of Commerce. And uh, prior to that, he served as a senior legislative aide to Supervisor Pat Herity of the Springfield District, and then was a staffer to former US Representative Tom Davis uh, of the 11th District. He has a master's degree in international commerce and policy from George Mason University, and a bachelor's degree in marketing from Penn State. Uh, and Kristen, I don't were you married when you joined, or you got married when you right after you joined the board, right? Where are you? Oh, I was married, but I, we had our first kid. Right. right. Okay. First kid. And then you went ahead and had a second one. <laughs> so now he has, yeah. he has two children. Um, there is something that we, we prepared for Christian and maybe Christian, I don't see you on the screen here. Maybe you could show yeah, the there. board. Okay. I'm sure you are. I just I don't, don't see you. See me. Yeah, second uh, there you are. I see you. Okay. So um, on behalf of the board, we did send Christian something as a uh, as a thank you for his service, and I was hoping he could sort of show it. It's a beautiful, very nice, so going the wrong way. Yeah. In honor of appreciation for your leadership and dedicated service with the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority Commission. So thank you very much for this, and I'll just say it's been quite a pleasure serving with all of you. I'm going to miss all of you, but I'm not going far. You'll still see me. Um, but it's just time for me. I, I found that uh, I just didn't have the time to commit to what I think a board member should be able to commit to. So happy to happy to pass the baton on to a great new appointee. I think we'll do great work for you all. Um, and I had a like 25 minute speech, but I'm not going to give it because <laughs> I know how long those board meetings can go. But I'll just say, um, it's really been a lot of fun and an honor to serve on EDA. And if I can leave you all with one bit of wisdom, because you knew that I had to, uh, I would just say to remember that an organization is only as good as its staff. Um, and the EDA, in my opinion, has the best staff in the country. Um, and I hope you guys will continue to take care of them and invest in them um, in the ways that we have, but, but even go farther than that um, so they can continue to excel into the leadership of our dynamic president. Thank you. And I, I just know personally, I, um, I always appreciated uh, Christian's contrarian viewpoint um, and his political wisdom. So I do want to thank you for it because there were times where I think you helped straighten us out and kept us out of some uh, uh, road bumps that could have gotten in the way. So thank you, Christian. Uh, and you know, we, we look forward to staying connected. Thanks for putting up with me for four years. Thank Absolutely. You. Would any board members like to chime in for a second and say something? So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly part of the group as well as some of the team members here who uh, came in at the same time. And I, I, I would say uh, this, this period of this board represents a, a, a very dramatic, probably 35 years of change in three or four, in three years here, we, um, uh, had, and, and Christian was certainly part of that. We had a dramatic, complete changeover of the board minus two team members, which the board had never seen that before. We, uh, we had a, 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 a new president that uh, Christian was, you know, part of helping us to, to make a, a key critical decision. We went through this dramatic change where the state, you know, uh, was at the bottom. And I think through a lot of work and energy bringing the our region and the state back to, and, and winning some very large deals and as much as we didn't win uh amazon we we all participated in elements that went into that package that helped amazon make that decision so not only amazing economic growth brand new leadership team through covid christian i mean you your your, your tenure here was uh helped shape this region and uh i wanted to thank you for for your for your help along the way and your leadership thank you Tim. so the only thing i would also add is that in the presence of all those team accomplishments you've been a great partner and so i i always felt like i could count on you for feedback and i could seek it from you without hesitation and for that i thank you thanks lenny Thank you, Christian. 
Thank you. All so right. Much. Take care, y'all. Don't Take say care now. don't say too late. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let me move on to, to my report. I just have a couple of things to report on. First being that we have um, Supervisor Smith, Supervisor Herity, and Supervisor Walkinshaw, hopefully I'm saying that correctly, as our next meetings, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. In December, we will have a summary of all of the supervisors' priorities and other matters that are on the top of their minds. We've learned a great deal from these one-on-one -on -one meetings, especially in light of the diversity of our county. And when I think of it, the diversity of our, our county, I mean in all ways, geographically, socially, economically, racially, culturally. I mean, we have such a diverse and amazing county. And we wanna take those insights and make sure we're listening and being supportive in ways that are in alignment with what we do as an economic development authority. So thanks to all of you who have been going to those meetings and we have a few more to, to finish up. Uh, and secondly, the legislative proposal to expand the board has been prepared and will be submitted in January. If approved, this expansion will take place in July of 2021. And the expansion is to add two additional commissioners. Um, again, I'm, I will be looking for you all to work with me on identifying potential uh, board members, commissioners that we may wanna introduce to Jeff as possible commissioners. And of course, we're looking for people with diverse interests, diverse backgrounds, ideas, perspectives, cultures, races. We, we want to really have a full spectrum of diversity on our board. So as you uh, meet business leaders that you think might align with the work that we do, I'm always open to those suggestions. And I know Chairman McKay is too, although he does have some folks that he would also like to consider for our board. And with that, I will turn the uh, meeting over to Victor Hoskins to make the president's report. Thank you, Kathy. Appreciate well, that. So um, it's been a been a very busy, um, very busy month. Even though it's only been a few weeks, um, if you can imagine that, um, we've covered quite a few things. Uh, but the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to give Mike uh, Bat a chance to talk a little bit about our talent initiative and um, where that is. Mike. Thanks, Victor. And first, let me welcome uh, Rick Wagner, who is an alumnus from uh, Microsoft. It's great to see you uh, joining the commission. So we look forward to to uh, having your, your leadership and, and support with the, with the commission. So um, talent initiative, we've been doing a lot. We have had a lot going on the last month. I'd say just a few highlights are, you know, we've signed some sponsorships. The, the one that's making the most impact right now is women in technology, where um, we're working on others that are similar, but with, we're really developing a good partnership with them and just finished a, um, another virtual career fair. This one that they, um, led, but we were the key sponsor of and did a lot to help drive the attendance to that um, through blogs, videos, and, and lots of, uh, lots of uh, social media outreach. And so the results of that were 50 plus companies that participated. We drove through our sponsorship. We actually had HP um, and then an 8A called Easy Dynamics participate as, a, as part of our sponsorship. But uh, there were 53 companies that participated and over 500 attendees and with 1,800 co uh, connections. So really successful event last week that we look to continue. So we're on a, we're on a roll now with you know, approximately one a month of uh, virtual career fairs that we're either leading or doing through partnerships like Women in Technology and look to have others coming down the path. We're doing some really innovative things now. We have a new um, temp on Kieran Collinson that's helping us with um, um, connecting with universities. We just heard from Steve where we need to bring more talent here um, to, the, to the Northern Virginia area so we can stop competing with each other and, and poaching from each other. There's, there's still 40 plus thousand jobs available in Fairfax County, 80,000 across uh, Northern Virginia. And so um, we, through the technology handshake and uh, uh, Kieran have reached out and connected with over 65 universities across the country, tech universities, big universities in the West Coast. And we're using that connection because that's where a lot of the students and alumni use that, that application to 
look for their career, careers and jobs. So we're, we're gonna start to do events with them. And two things that I'll just highlight is we're gonna promote the work in Virginia, work in Northern Virginia, com site and that site is really starting to make some impact um, the stat we uh, DCI our partner here um, has, has shared just the latest stat from this talent initiative website is we're, we're approaching 30,000 um, hits per month we were you know 20 30,000 hits per month on that site and so it's really out there to promote the region as a great place to live work and play as well as providing you know insight and promoting all of our great companies that are here so it's a, it, so we're going to promote that site to those 65 universities and then we're going to do some special one-off events we've just started a conversation with BAE for example to do a custom recruiting event just for BAE and see where that goes working with the west coast um, UC schools to help promote them because historically the public sector BAE has only promoted here in the region so now we're saying, hey, with this virtual world we're in, we can recruit remotely. So we're doing great partnerships with that. Um, we are working now towards our next virtual career fair, January 28th, which is going to be laser focused on a lot of jobs that we have out here in the cyber security, security clearance world. So we're working with to recruit uh, 20 companies to participate in that with us. Um, and uh, we're well ahead of the game and, and making sure we're, we're uh, down the path on that. I'd say we still have, we're, we're getting into the upskills program area, but there's a lot more we can do. Um, it was great to hear from Steve around the, the you know, starting at the K-12 um, level. So we're working with Greater Washington Partnerships. They have K-12 through K part, um, pathways. Um, Microsoft, Microsoft has a program called TEALS, Tech, Tech Education and Literacy Schools. And so I'm starting to engage there. They actually have some of their own engineers and their own staff out teaching now in the Fairfax County schools as volunteers as part of their program. So pretty cool where we look to, to engage in that. And then um, lastly is just um, something that, uh, again, where we're reaching out across the country to recruit talent here, did a great uh, working with Alan, the, the communications team with DCI, um, uh, targeted campaigns and marketing and, and did an article in TechCrunch that has 4 million monthly subscribers. Um, that was a great um, article that went out uh, that really is promoting the county and the region. So a lot's going on and I think we're making, you know, each month just progress again with this collective team helping. So thank you. Hey Mike, I'm going to share one cool sort of cir circular story. So the, some of the backbone we've been using for our uh, virtual career fairs is itself a great Virginia story. So uh, a, a couple of years ago, uh, the company Brazen, who was a Virginia, Northern Virginia uh, technology uh, startup company was looking at potentially selling. They were, they were doing fairly well, but through their pivoting in this time period to help these types of events, they become one of the fastest growing companies in Northern Virginia. So it's kind of cool that our actions and activity to create awareness for jobs has created jobs for another Virginia technology company. So well done. And thank you for supporting Virginia technology companies. Yeah, that's a great point because not only have we contracted to use Brazen there in Arlington, but women in technologies, that's the technology they used for the event we had last week with them as well. Yep. Yeah, they, they've grown. This has been one of their best years ever uh, and, and helping companies throughout the country, but they're here based here in Northern Virginia. Yes, and um, uh, first of all, I, I just want to, I want to thank Mike. Um, he, as everyone knows, he joined us just, it was just about a year ago now, Mike, that you joined yeah, us. Yeah, Spencer Wood and I both started. We were just chatting before. This week is our one year anniversary. Wow. Yeah, and, um, and he, when he came from Microsoft, you know, he was really saying that, you know, he wanted to do something different, um, you know, kind of his second career. And I just want to say, Commissioner Wagner, if you have any other um, employees that want a second career, <laughs> our doors are open. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. You want to fulfill that need for the second career. <laughs> Thank you so much. Still needs to time. fill 1,500 jobs. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's right. Um, so um, the, one of the things I did want to, um, I'm glad Mike mentioned it, was the, the speed with which we've gone from about 300 and 400 hits a month on our website to 30,000. Um, it is amazing. And um, those hits are coming from other markets. They're not just our market. They're coming from New York. They're coming from San Francisco. They come from other market that we are digitally targeting. Um, this, is, this is where, you know, this is where you wanted us to be. 
Um, and I'm really proud of the work that, that he, uh, Aiden, and the rest of the team has, has done on this. It's been really fantastic. Um, speaking of, of marketing, I want to uh, let Alan take a moment to talk a little bit about um, some, some latest stories. Alan, you ready? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Victor. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the new commissioner as well. Uh, so I have a quick update tonight for communications. As, as you know, the big story of the month in October came from the Volkswagen Group of America when the company announced uh, a 20-year lease to keep its headquarters in Fairfax County. It's going to take just about 200,000 square feet in Reston Town Center. Now, like with the Microsoft announcement back in May, this is a great sign in a number of ways. It's an amazing retention announcement of a major name brand employer. It reaffirmed our, the attractiveness of Fairfax County as a corporate headquarters location. It reaffirmed our attractiveness for North American headquarters of international firms, it continues to diversify our economic base. The company did not shrink its real estate footprint at all. And oh yes, it happened during a, the pandemic and it continues our string of really amazing leasing activity during the pandemic compared to a lot of other areas. So this was a great announcement, a great story for us to get out there. We worked very quickly to get a release written, posted and pushed out to area media. And because of that, um, you see uh, that we got mentioned in a couple of stories, including the two that you see highlighted here. We got a great quote from the VW CEO that emphasized the importance of being in Northern Virginia to build on his company's innovation for years to come. This is a, so many great themes here. Uh, we sent out the press release nationally and DCI, our marketing partners, including it in our national pitches. As you can see uh, in the box there, we got about 48 million impressions for this and garnered about 1.7 million in earned media just for this release. We also pushed it out on social media and created an announcement video that, believe it or not, got 5,500 views just on Victor's LinkedIn page. So we've been very busy on the communications and special events staffs uh, this month with a lot of events, a lot of webinars, but. I thought you'd appreciate the attention that we got for the VW announcement. It really is a great story. So Victor, that's it for communications tonight. Thank you and back over to you. Victor, you're on mute. You're on mute, my friend. Uh, before, uh, thank you. I appreciate that guy, sorry about that. I didn't want to make noise in the background. Um, I did want uh, Alex to take a moment to talk a little bit about our regional uh, economic development strategy that we're working on. Um, Alex, you want to go ahead and uh, take the mic? You got it. Thanks, Victor, and, and good evening, everyone. We have been collaborating with uh, economic development organizations and, and other uh, regional organizations throughout the Washington metropolitan area on an economic development strategy for the entire region. So it's a, it's a bold initiative. Um, it was initiated uh, by Connected DMV and their initiative um, that uh, was looking at ways that we as a region can mitigate uh, COVID-19 and, and look forward to a more prosperous economic future. Victor is the chair of the, the task force for the economic development strategy. And, and I am leading uh, a number of the work groups and teams along with a counterpart at Connected DMV. Um, so, so right now we actually have five teams set up that are, are laying the groundwork for this strategy and the teams are being led um, by different groups from throughout the region. So we're weaving that into our process as well uh, and ensuring that it's not um, that the information or the direction is not coming from any one place. We are working with Montgomery County. We're working with Washington, D.C. We're working with WMATA. Uh, we've got research support from George Mason University Center for Regional Analysis, the Fuller Institute, uh, and data analytics support from groups like Booz Allen Hamilton. So it's uh, public, private, and academia on this. And uh, what we'll be doing between now and the beginning of December is really um, uh, laying the foundation, coming back to the steering committee with some of our ideas, uh, getting feedback from them about how this may be approached and the areas that uh, 
we think we can effectively collaborate on. You know, and one one of the things was was mentioned by Stephen Murray earlier, and is, is just was just a topic uh, in Mike's report, which is obviously talent development. That's something that uh, affects us all, and and we can work together on uh, and and uh, you know ensure that all of our employers have the workforce that that we need, and all of our residents have access to to jobs. So we're looking at, at things like that. Um, but we're also looking at things that, um, for example, like we've done through the Nova EDA, where there might be out of market um, uh, trade and promotional opportunities that we can collaborate on. And so um, it's, it's exciting. We have, you know, the, the, the Nova EDA on board, the Maryland Alliance is on board, uh, and Washington DC is on board. And then, as I mentioned, there's a consortium of, of private and academic, academic partners. So I'm very pleased with, with how everything is going and we've, how we've held everything together. And it's actually working virtually has made the world actually just that much smaller uh, that we're, we can connect uh, with such frequency and, and see each other and get to know each other in this way. So um, appreciate the opportunity to give the update. Thank you. And I just wanna say that uh, Alex, um, Alex Imes and um, let me see Spencer and Jatender, and they have just been working so hard on this. And if if you if you think it was complicated to get the ten jurisdictions in Northern Virginia to to collaborate, there is there is like there's like a there's a a cubed root. I mean, it, this is a this is to the tenth power. I mean, it is exponential. It is so much more complicated. But we're getting there because um, our teams are working together and they understand the challenge and they understand that this is the right time to do it. Um, I'm just gonna to touch on a few of the, of the, of the events that I've, I've done uh, this, this month. Um, what, one of the things that I did was I had the opportunity to moderate a panel with, uh, with Dr. Washington from GMU, um, with Dr. Phyllis Shank, from, uh, who is the head of cybersecurity for North of Grumman, uh, Carmen Medina, um, who was a former CIA uh, deputy director um, and a former uh, uh, chief of staff of the cybersecurity um, group at IBM. I have to say this was the most intimidating panel that I've ever done. Um, I just asked five questions and they talked and then it was over. <laughs> it, it was fantastic. Next slide, please. It was so much fun. I learned so much. Um, another event I had the opportunity to participate in was the Asian American Chamber of Commerce um, a virtual, uh, they did a virtual summit. Um, I gave some introductory remarks um, and it was really a pleasure. Um, you know, we have great uh, a great partnership with the Asian American Chamber of Commerce for, for many years, um, and we're just continuing to build on that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this was a, a, a great uh, informational uh, webinar. Uh, this was one of the things that uh, Karen Schma, our Director of, of Diversity and Small Business, uh, pulled together. This group, um, this, this Fairfax County Law Foundation, giving free legal, legal services to any small business um, for on, to deal with their leases, to deal with um, you know financing issues, um, and then this start small, think big group, an amazing organization offering a suite of services to small businesses for free. The only requirement is that you are a for-profit business. I was just so blown away by that, and and they they introduced their services, and we're going to continue to expand this relationship, and we're going to take this show on the road. Uh, down Richmond Corridor uh, to Springfield and to other parts. Uh, we're going to try to take it to all the revitalization areas uh, in the county. Next slide, please. Uh, this was an I had an opportunity to listen um, to uh, some of our thought leaders for the region, some of our most important political leaders, um, to hear Jeff McKay, um, Chairman McKay, and uh, Chairman Mendelson, and uh, 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 Angela Alsobrook, uh, County Executive of Prince George's talk about the same challenges and the same issues. You see how much we have in common and you can see the policy opportunities merging together. Um, and I think everybody's realizing that we are more alike than we are different. And that river um, is not a division. Um, it's just actually a pleasant place to, to build uh, condominiums. Next slide, please. Um, so today I had the opportunity to do uh, Springfield and Beyond. Um, Alex Stalicker uh, actually had a big role in organizing this. Um, I was on with uh, Supervisor Lusk um, and Mr. Biggert from uh, Visit Fairfax, um, and we were talking about all the opportunities down in, in Springfield. I have to say that I think Springfield is actually the Richmond, uh, Richmond Highway Corridor, biggest, some of the biggest opportunities in the county, and we're talking to investors now um, about, about how um, they can invest down here. 
Um, and some of those conversations, um, I think, are going to be quite productive, particularly since they now have this economic incentive program. Next slide, please. Um, I get to, tomorrow. I get to be um, on the stage um, with with Saul over at the uh, Tyson's partnership. Um, this is uh, Tyson's 2050. Uh, looking forward to this. Uh, we both are giving uh, different keynotes. Um, I'm I'm really uh, more the, the the closer, and I really am going to focus on what I believe is really an op optimistic picture. It's interesting. I'm an optimist. All right. I think that today the stock market said something about optimism. Um, that that Pfizer. Um, you know, cure um, hitting 90% uh, effectiveness is, is uh, something that we all needed to hear at this point. Um, I think that the future is bright. I think our uh, days ahead of us are much greater than the ones behind us. Next slide, please. And this is the last item I'm gonna cover. Um, I was able to do a, um, a leadership conversation um, with um, Mr. Mahan. Mr. Mahan is the chair of the um, Leadership Greater Washington. He is fantastic. He's a fantastic um, in interviewer. And um, really talked, he really talked a lot about, you know, how, impo what, how important leadership is and how different it is from management. You know, um, how important it is to, you know, point to direction and just let your team do the work. Because they know how to do the work. You don't have to teach them how to do their work. That's why you hired them. Um, it's really picking the North Star and driving toward that North Star. You don't want to put your ladder, as he said, against the wrong building and get to the top of the ladder and find it in the wrong place. I mean, that's the problem when leadership picks the wrong building uh, or picks the wrong direction. You know, we've been very fortunate um, that we've been part of a very dynamic um, environment. Um, I think right now, um, this is just a pause. Um, I heard, um, I heard uh, Doris uh, Kearns Goodwin, who a lot of you know, um, I actually had a chance to meet her once a couple of years ago at a conference um, at a book signing. And, um, you know, she wrote the, um, you know, uh, she wrote some en en enormously important books, but she was talking about this latest leadership book that she wrote on the presidents. And um, there was one thing that she said at the end of the interview, both Alan and I heard the same interview. And when she said this, I went like, oh yeah, this lady's, this, she's got it. She was talking about the resilience of the United States. And this is what she said. She said, look, in World War II, okay, we build a tank every four minutes, we build an airplane every seven minutes, and we build a ship every day we can do this COVID thing. This is not a problem. And I think that that's really the, the note I wanna, wanna leave on is that I am so optimistic about the future. Um, and that, you know, you know what, what lies behind us, what lies in front of us is little things than what lies within us. And what lies within us is the determination to overcome any, any, any tragedy, any factor. That's our country, that's who we are. And I think that's who Fairfax is. I think that's, I think that's why we get up every morning because we want to overcome the challenge. And um, I feel lucky to be part of this organization. I feel blessed uh, that you guys selected me to be part of this team. Um, I hope that, um, that we are able to do uh, even greater things that we've done so far. Thank you. Kathy, you're on mute. Kathy, you're on mute. Thank you. Okay. You it's getting it. late. <laughs> Those of you playing Zoom bingo, yeah. Zoom bingo. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go into closed session. And uh, so I would, um, the motion is to move into closed session to discuss personnel and strategy matters. So I would like to have a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve that we move into closed session. Do we have a second? Second, Commissioner Hartridge. Thank you. And um, Mike, would you do a roll call? Sure. Happy to do that. Uh, Mr. Partridge. Aye. Ms. Hainsworth. Aye. Mr. Wagner. Aye. Dr. Johnson. Aye. Vice Chairman Quigley. Uh, Chairman Lang. Aye. Okay. So we will be going into a different Zoom call. I hope you all have it. And then uh, when we're finished with closed session, we'll be coming back into open session. So we'll see you in a couple minutes. <laughs>